Hey, beloved saints, I'm going back to the simplicity in Christ. I know I speak fast. My thoughts go like rapid fire. When I'm feeling good, I'm on a, I am roll. And also, please don't take my passion as anger. It's not. I get frustrated sometimes, but I'm not angry. I get excited, and then I, I hate every false way. Uh, I realize, you know, when I delve into deeper things sometimes that some reason I, I'm not understood. Like I did something yesterday showing the reason why the story of Lazarus and the rich man was told. It wasn't even about the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It wasn't to explain it or what it meant or anything. I was showing the surrounding parables and the questions being asked and why Jesus even told the story. And it was just to show that the rich are not any more righteous or favored or blessed by God than the poor because that was the common belief and I've heard preachers today say that you know uh, if you want to be blessed give to a rich ministry because that means God's blessings on them. nonsense so that was the whole point of it but again I, I wasn't understood so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you the top 10 false gospel messages or corruptions of the gospel that you will see on television in books and on YouTube. Now I'd like to start out by saying I do not believe that everyone that preaches this is unsaved. I think it started out as trying to address the carnality of Christians, but it turned into a corruption of a simplicity in Christ. And if you, you don't give the real gospel, then a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit and all the good works they're doing of changing their life and getting rid of sin and doing good works and serving their church and tithing and whatever else they're doing is all dead works um, because the Holy Spirit isn't in them. They have to be born again and you're not sealed by the Holy Spirit until you've completely trusted in what God has done for you. All right, so I will give a very clear, short description of what the gospel is is so let me give you these top 10 false corruptions or additions to the gospel that is confusing people but it, it falls right in line with the rest of religions because it will definitely definitely be based on something that man does for god uh, i'd like to remind you the gospel is uh the salvation eternal life is not a reward for trying to be good or keeping God's commandments, or promising to do better, or any of that, okay? It is not a reward. Eternal life is simply a free gift based on what God has done for you. So let's look at the top 10. These are not in any particular order. I'm just listing them as they came up to my mind. Number one, the gospel is not a prayer that you recite, and it is not anything that you say. All right, so the gospel is not a sinner's prayer. You'll see a lot of preachers going, okay, repeat after me. Uh, Dear God, please save me. Um, Jesus died on the cross. I promise to do better. Uh, yada, yada, whatever they say in these sinner's prayers. Because those of us that stand on the biblical gospel, the way to salvation, are often accused of saying, oh, you just say some prayer and you're saved. Absolutely not. Uh, I think once you're saved, you should say, pray to God and say, thank you for what you did for me. Open up the fellowship line. It is not asking. You know, it's not a prayer or saying anything to God. So it's not asking God to save you either. Because what would be his answer? I already did. Just believe me. I'm trying to give it to you. I did everything to save you. All the work was done from the foundation of the world. So, the gospel is not you praying a prayer or asking God to save you. You don't have to ask Jesus to save you. What, you want me to die again? I already did, right? Number two, the gospel is not a commitment you make, all right? So, the gospel is not a commitment to live godly lives, to uh, serve as a disciple, it is not any of those things. You will not find one place in scripture that tells you you have to commit to God for him to save you. You won't find one verse in scripture about you committing your life to God 
for him to save you. Now, you'll see several verses when Jesus is talking to potential disciples, telling them that they must commit to him to be, or they're not worthy to be his disciple. And let me say that once a person is saved, it is God's will that all his children commit their life to listening to the Holy Spirit, to growing in grace, to reading their Bible, to being obedient to his ways, and growing in uh, experiential holiness and goodness and love. Okay, that's God's will for all his children once they're saved. But this video is not about how a Christian should live. This is about how to even become a real Christian, all right? And so far, ask, reciting some prayer or asking God to save you, nor making a commitment for your future to be committed to him, save you either. So these are things, that, that was no, number one and number two, all right? Number three, the gospel is not a promise that you make. A gospel is not a, a promise for you to say, God, if you save me, I promise to stop these bad habits. I promise to live better. I promise to go to church. I promise to get baptized. I promise to give my money. I promise I won't ask you for anything again. I, the gospel is not you making a promise to God. Again, it's God's promise to you. You need to believe him. We're going to go over clearly what the gospel is biblically. So, number four, the gospel is not what you do for God. It is not a command for you to do anything for God. All right? The gospel is God's good news of what he did for you. God is your salvation. Okay? It is not anything you do for God. It's what he has already done for you and you receive it when you believe it. You know, they're always saying, oh, you just believe some facts. No, the gospel is not you believing. You're not saved because you believe uh, Jesus is the son of God. You're not saved because you even believe he died and rose again. You're not saved because you believe that he died for our sins. You're saved because you believe he died for yours, that he was buried and rose again, and you put your trust completely on what Jesus did for you. That's how you're saved. You are trusting. The pistios for believe, the Greek word, means to trust. So you're having confidence in what God did for you. What an insult to say uh, the majority of Christians don't believe it. They don't believe that Jesus was enough. They still think they're maintaining it by something they do. It is very sad. Well, you could just do anything. They'll go crazy if they realize they've got complete freedom. And yeah, could technically do anything they want. They really, they, they lose their mind. They, they can't imagine that freedom. Not having hell d themselves dangled over hell to be good so they don't do it. They, they don't know how to handle that. It doesn't make sense to them. All right, you got to get saved first, and then you'll see it's the love of Christ that constrains us. All right, number five, oh, the gospel is not you giving God something. I gave my heart to Jesus. Okay, I gave my or committed my Life to Christ. How many times you heard that? Whenever I hear testimony like that, I'm like, next. Testifonies, I call them. I think they mean well, but I would ask them, if you t you come to me and you go, uh, I, I asked you, when were you saved? Well, I gave my heart to Christ at 15. Great. When were you saved? That's what I would say. If you tell me, I'd say, How, when were you saved? Well, I, I uh, committed my life and I gave my heart to Jesus when I was seven. Great. When were you saved? When did you trust that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the only path to heaven? Because you giving God something doesn't tell me you believed him. And you're saved by believing. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 
So you can give your heart, and give your life, try to be a good Christian, a good disciple, and never be born again. And the majority of testimonies on there are about what they did. I gave God something. I gave him my heart. I gave him my life. I committed myself to serving him. You don't do that all the time. You don't always serve him, right? You can't rely on that. See, anything that points to you for salvation, it is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was what you give to God or what you're doing for God you can boast. I'm saved because I did this. You see? It's very subtle because it sounds right. It sounds righteous. But there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. Okay, so it's not giving God something, your heart, your life, or any of that. Number six, it is not a pledge or some like promise or pledge to do good things in the future. It is not a, a promise or a pledge to go to church, to serve the church, to give money to the church or any of that. Number seven, it is not repentance from sin. The gospel is not a command that you give up bad habits and start good ones. The gospel is not you turning over a new leaf. The gospel is not reformation and making a New Year's uh, resolution. All right? It's none of that. These things are proper in their place. But you can't even know how much you sin until you get the Holy Spirit and he starts working on the deep heart issues. Okay? Outer behavior is often from an unregenerate mind and heart. We have to be born again. Do you understand that? Born again. Also, I put a note here. You do not try to clean yourself by works of the flesh. Those in the flesh can't please God. It means trying to perform for salvation. You cannot clean yourself up by some kind of works of the flesh because it's not cleaning yourself up. It's the blood creating you anew. You are born again. You're a whole new spirit person. Okay, this flesh you're trying to clean up, he's the old man. And no matter how much sin you take off of him, he's still filthy. All right, that's why flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. That's why you must be born again. So the blood makes you brand new. You're not dirty anymore. So you don't have to clean up sin in order to get saved. That is is a process that begins once you are saved. And plus, what if a guy drinks a, a fifth of liquor or a 12-pack a day, and then you see him, like, uh, three weeks later, and he's having, like, two beers? You, you don't know. I mean, you don't know his progress. Oh, he's not saved. He drank two beers. Well, he was shooting heroin and drinking a fifth of liquor uh, a couple weeks ago. How do you know where he started? You're going to judge his race? You don't even know where his beginning line was. And anyway, Buddhist, atheist, a lot of people live very good, upright, moral lives. And false prophets and false converts look like sheep. That's, what the, that's not a satanic hand symbol either. They look like sheep. So you can't go by the performance. They'll deceive you. All right? Plus, it's not your business anyway. You worry about you. So no, that is the biggest heresy. There are tons of verses on repent and repentance that have nothing to do with sin. Have, did you hear me? There are 38 of God repenting. All right? There's tons of verses. There's verses where God does not want Israel to repent. He does not want them to change their mind and return to Egypt. Tons of verses, all right? We have to go with what the original author meant. And it means think again or change your mind. Same thing. You can repent of sin, but no person has ever repented of all their sin. Ever. There's sins you commit in ignorance. For instance, you told somebody that your sister's birthday was December 5th, and you've told them that all your life. Then you find out it was the 6th. You lied. You did it in ignorance. Doesn't matter. You you missed the mark. They used to have to make sacrifices for sin they didn't know they committed. They did in ignorance. 
So there, there's those. There's sins of omission, things you were supposed to do that you didn't. Then there's sins of the heart and the mind. See, these are all things of the flesh. You think it's just big ones like murdering and fornication and stuff like that. It's not. It's not. It's deep. This flesh, it is sin. It is the old man. I don't care what you do to it. It does not get clean. You need to be born again. And you only get born again by trusting in the blood to make you new. All right? They say cleanse you. I say it's more than that. You're born again. You're a whole new person. You don't have anything to clean up. So once you've trusted Christ, you are clean. All right? Then he begins the new life when you're walking with him. Again, this is not about that. Once you're saved, God wants you to grow in grace through the milk of the word. And he wants you to get progressively better in your walk and to be more of a spiritual man. But not <laughs> to get saved. This is the biggest heresy. If you have trusted Christ alone in what he did and none of what you do, you have repented for salvation. You have, you have changed your mind about how you get to heaven. All right? So, because uh, Paul told the Athenians at Mars Hill, they had to, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Of what? Trusting in their idols. Don't trust in how good you are or in your idolatry or, or, any, or your dead works. Like Hebrews says, let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So dead religious works, sacraments, anything. And trust in grace. All right? So, those, those are some big ones. Now, uh, number eight. It is not a public proclamation. Let me make sure I didn't. Yes. Uh, that would include calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm not going to get in that argument. I think it's really just gone overboard with it. Um, you don't have to call upon or ask God to save you, as I said. I didn't know which one to put that in. But you don't have to ask him what he's already done. You just receive it. And when you do call upon him, it's because you believed him. So you got saved by believing uh, you know, and then you call on them. It makes sense that way. So, um, it's not a public proclamation. It's not standing up in a church, say, uh, who receives Jesus and who promises to turn from their sins? Me. Okay, now you're saved. You made a public proclamation. Come down the aisle. Kneel down at the foot of the cross here. That didn't save you. You walking down the aisle, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, he got it from Billy Sunday. One false prophet taken from another false prophet, and it just keeps going. So, you end up, I'm not saying the man wasn't saved. I don't know. I don't know his heart, but I'm telling you, he preached a false gospel message. Uh, so, a, a public proclamation, standing up in church, raising your hand, walking down an aisle, all right? It's not confessing him to men either. When it says, if you deny me, I will deny you. There's two verses. One's in the Old Testament. If those Jews would have denied that he was the promised Christ, God would have denied him. He doesn't know him, right? And then there's a verse in the New Testament. If, you, if we deny him, he'll deny us. And that is about service. If you deny him service, he'll deny you serving in his kingdom. So there's uh, verses on that. But you can publicly confessing, uh, Peter denied him uh, three times. The Pharisees that believed, the, leader, the, the, the leaders in Jerusalem, said many believed but didn't speak of it. They hid it, wouldn't confess him for fear of being kicked out of the synagogue. Because the synagogue was everything. It was their financial, it was, it was all areas of their social, their spiritual, all of that was bound up together. So it's not publicly confessing him. Now, there's some people in foreign countries that if they confess them, they can't continue to do the work of the Lord and evangelize to people in secret. Though they can't, they hold secret meetings and they tell people, like in these Muslim countries, if they confess publicly when asked, they can't continue to do their work or spread the gospel. The workers are few. Do you think they're condemned? No. No. You don't know the situation. And besides, if that was something that you had to do and you were saved by believing, then God would give you the power. Okay, but it's not. It's not. And I know that's going to shock a lot of people. All right. Uh, more public proclamations would be water baptism. Now, in the Old Testament, in order to become a Jew, you had to be water baptized into it. Now, that Old Testament mikvah was a foreshadow of us being baptized into the body. 
Paul says there's one baptism. He said, I didn't come to baptize, but to preach Jesus, right? So when it says there's one baptism, one body, what is that baptism? Holy Spirit baptism. That is when you have trusted Christ, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. How long? Till the day of redemption, the, when the body's redeemed. And you are baptized into Christ's body by faith. Then, because you are saved, you can and probably should get water baptized. But that's not part of salvation. All right? That is a symbol that you died, were buried, and rose again with Jesus. You go under the water, you die. You're buried under the water. You come back out as a new creature. You rose again with Christ. Okay? It is a symbol, as I said before, just like a wedding ring is a symbol. If you take the ring off, you're still married. The ring doesn't make you married. Here, put it on. Now you're married. No. If I put it on somebody else, are they married? No. So, again, water baptism in the Old Testament was a shadow of the one baptism, the Holy Spirit baptism. And that's what Paul's trying to say by one baptism. Because they were claiming, I'm a Paul. I'm an I'm a Apollos. I'm of Peter. He's like, did we die for you? No, there's one baptism. I didn't come here to water baptize. Okay? So he, the baptism Paul was preaching was Holy Spirit baptism. And then you should. When the unit got baptized, he asked Philip, what prevents me from being baptized? He said, if you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. So he got saved when he believed, and then he got baptized to proclaim that. All right? Number nine, the gospel is not surrendering to Christ or surrendering to his lordship or any of that because uh, surrendering to Jesus as master or any of those things because no one can call Jesus Lord except it be by the Holy Ghost. So if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he is your Lord. Doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. A lot of people that aren't in Christ call him the Lord. We see that in Matthew 27. I mean, uh, what is it, Matthew, Matthew 20, I can't remember, anyway, um, Matthew seven twenty one. there it is, uh, where they say, Lord, Lord, but look what we did, look at our many wonderful works, I uh, never knew you, your work of iniquity, why, because they're working, bringing their wonderful works to him, we preached, we cast out demons, look at all our wonderful, look what we did for you, God, Amazing the blindness of people that can read that verse and say, oh, got to have more works. Really? They just tried to offer them. They were, those were the good people. Those were the people in the church. They weren't the ones in the bars picking up hookers. No, they were casting out demons, do all kinds of good works. Why would they boast to Jesus? It was because of the sin in their life. So stupid. Sin was dealt with 2,000 years ago. It was done. It was nailed to the cross. See, if you don't believe it, the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. It's foolishness, the foolishness of preaching. We hear the message of what God did for us. We believe it, and we're saved. It's just crazy to people. They can't get it. It's amazing the number of Christians that mock the gospel. Those I wonder about. Well, you know, but you still got to be obedient to stay saved. Wait, wait, wait. You, but how much obedient? How do you, with, nobody's obedient 100% of the time. Well, it's your willingness. Oh, no, no. It's not for him that willeth or for him that runneth. That's not what you're trying to do or you're willing to do or what you're doing. But if God is showing mercy, you're basing part of salvation on what you do. So wait, if a person believes the gospel and then they die like 30 seconds after, are they saved? Yes. Okay. What if they get saved and then they like sin later? Well, it depends on how often. Well, where's that scripture? How often we sin? Uh... What kind of sin? What if it's just like a little one? And what are the big ones? What are the, you know, where's the line there? So you get saved by what Jesus did, but you keep it by what you do? Do you see the insanity of that? People don't understand the doctrine of reward, chastisement, and blessing. It was that there's sin unto death, you know? So they, they don't get it. They don't get it. Because the cross is foolishness. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. If our gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost. So if they completely just can't wrap their mind around the fact that God loves them that much, he did all the work, he gets all the glory, it doesn't matter what you're doing, I don't care you, that you that, that's not fair you, that God does that and, and still get to heaven. You, you worry about you. 
I, I've never seen a person that that's born again enjoy sin like that. They, their sin is ruined for them. It never feels good. Again, they're tormented constantly. All right. So you don't uh, surrender. That that's not the gospel. Again, it's not what you're doing. It's not your commitment. It's not you surrendering to him as Lord. He is Lord. He's the name above all names, whether you're surrendering to him or not. And my dad is still my dad when I'm disobedient or obedient. He's still my father. I was born into his family. Oh, but you can be disinherited. No. Israel was temporarily disinherited as a nation. Uh, Saul was temporarily forsaken by God in his kingdom as a king, but not for eternity. People, do, they don't get the faithfulness of God. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. They, they don't believe it. So surrendering to him as Lord has nothing to do with you being saved. He's your Lord once you trust in him. So if you've trusted Christ, guess what? He becomes your Lord. And he's the Lord whether you're his or not. All right? People really misunderstand that. Number 10. Ah, this is the big one. The gospel is not a collaboration or cooperative effort between you and God. Did you hear me? The gospel is not a collaborative effort or a cooperative effort, some cooperation, some collaboration between what you're doing and what God did. No. The gospel, now we'll get right to the gospel so you can see why it's not a collaborative effort. It's for him that worketh not. Now, if it has to be not only, you can't work. If you're doing anything to get or keep salvation, it, you can't be saved. Because if it's works, it's no longer grace. You're fallen from grace. You have not received it. Why? Because you're trying to earn what he's freely giving you. All right? He's saying, look, I did all the work. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. God's power unto salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. See, it's what Jesus did. He became your sin, and then he gives you his righteousness. Jesus didn't have any sin at all. So how did he become it? Well, the same way we become righteousness and don't have any. We're not holy, righteous, and good, but when we trust in Christ, we're in Christ, and we get what he is put on our account. God sees us as holy and perfect and just without sin. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's been done. So Jesus took the punishment we deserved so we can get the blessings he deserves. You hear me? Jesus took the punishment we deserve so that we can have the blessings he deserves. All right? It's not fair. Get over it. But that's how much God loves you. So the gospel is God's power into salvation. It is the truth of God's work done for you. Okay? It is the truth of what Jesus did for you. Not anything you do for him. Now, back to number 10. It is not a collaborative effort of Jesus dying, being buried, and rose again, plus your obedience to parts of the Mosaic law. You offended one, you've offended all, plus everybody sinned, so that law is broken, can't be justified by it. You have to have kept it from birth to death and thought were indeed. And you can't bring your attempts at keeping the law, yet failing at it, and adding that to the perfect righteousness of God. That's why Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness, go about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, which comes by faith. So what you need to submit to is God's righteousness. By what? Admitting that you don't have anything to bring to the table. It's arrogant to think you're bringing something to the salvation table when God himself sent his son, became you on the cross, wore your filthy sin in his own body. We don't even know what he must have spiritually endured. 
that separation from his father in those moments, that torment he went through, and that's not enough. And to think you are going to add to that, that wasn't enough, God. I'm going to bring here, I quit drinking. Now I'm really saved. No. Again, this isn't about how you should be living once you are saved. All right? This is about false ways that cannot save you. And I guarantee 95% of the preachers on here and in most of the churches, and trust me, in my little town, my little Southern Baptist town, my neighbor is a Baptist church. Every one of them had added something to the gospel. Everyone. And the big one was repent from sin. Nowhere does it say repent from sin to be saved. Repent. Turn to Christ. Change your mind and believe on Christ. Turn from whatever you trust in, your dead works, your idols, and turn to the living God. Repent from dead works and of faith towards God. So you're turning to faith in God through the finished work of his son. All right? So now that you know the real gospel, it was all what God did for you. It's God's work for you. It's Jesus bearing the punishment you deserve so you can have the blessings he deserves. Now, isn't that glorious good news? Because that's what the gospel means. Good news. You should be doing the happy jig right now. Hope you get it, man. Hope you get it. Now you can spot them. You can spot them right away. All right? You will always feel, uh, when the tables turn to you. But you'll always glorify God when your salvation's based on Jesus. Because he did not fail as Savior. He's called Savior because he saved the world. Anyone that'll put their trust in what he did, he saved them. He bought us with his own blood. We can't be unbought and we can't be unborn. All right? God bless you guys.